Hello, everyone. Uh, the purpose of this discussion today um, is to sort of give a mini lecture on the two films that you watch. One is Why We Are Here, um, and the other one is Life's Rocking Start. Really, that's a, a summary of the book that you're reading, um, the story of Earth. So both pertain uh, you know, to both the film and the book. So I'm going to give you, you know, some of the major key points, at least in uh, the film on Life's Rocking Start, that will take you through the Red Earth phase of Robert Hazen's discussion. All right, and I'll do the complete film on why we are here and talk to you about the highlights on that and what is actually. Okay, here we go. So I'm gonna do a screen share and let's have a look at um, PowerPoint. All right, there you go. So now we've got here um, a really you know, a little cartoon drawing of the life and the origins of Earth. Um, you know, the, us and the recipe, you know, somebody making, you know, a big soup. Uh, there you see all the chemicals down there, DNA. Um, and as funny as that might be, well, some of you might find it funny, some of you not. It's sort of not the way that it actually happened. We need to go in much deeper time to figure out, you know, how this has actually occurred. So let's have a look. Now, as far as going to the first film we saw, which is why we are here, let's think about this. Um, the main rift, uh, you know, through the entire film, you know, has been about science, right? From the word go, he starts talking about ways of thinking about the world. And he's just giving you examples of what science has found a scientific way of thinking. The examples, you know, aren't that they're interesting, but they're not that critical to our class. There's a few that might be, that might tie in, but really we want to think about what he's trying to think, right? Now, a scientific way of thinking is why you are here. You know, it's made the entire world around you. Every time I reach for, you know, my handy cell phone, I think thinking about, you know, how much incredible technology and science has gone to producing something like this. You know, and as far as my eyes can see, the world is, you know, um, is a noble world based on science, on our discoveries um, that um, I would probably certainly not be the person I am. I'm probably not here because science has altered the course of human destiny, you know, so much that I can't even understate stated right so that's one of the things for to think about that's one of the real reasons that you are here is that science now brian cox in the film was trying to get you know um what it is in nature what is it about nature this interesting and so studyable by science and then how does study go about you know science go about studying nature so um let's have a look first thing he says is that order is in everything Everywhere you look, as far as you can, I can see there are patterns and there are order in this pattern. I remember he started to look at the meandering of rivers, right, for one pattern and how you can discern that and, um, and then how you can measure it. And once you measure it, you can see the patterns. Additionally, he started looking at the leopard's coats. Once we can see the patterns which you establish, once you look for those patterns, you can see them everywhere. There's an underlying order. Now, all of this, of course, as he mentioned, too, and he, a direct quote that, um, as Galileo said, that nature is a language, or nature is a process written in the language of mathematics. Now, it is. Everything else, everything in the world can come down to a mathematical relationship, right? But the issue is, it's just too darn complicated to keep track of the mathematics. You know, some of the most simple things in physics, like the laws of gravity and things that we can actually model mathematically because the complexity doesn't get away from us, but it does in a hurry. Therefore, mathematics is something of a tool we use, but it's not often really applicable. If there are any mathematics that we do use, what we're trying to do is sort of understand the underlying rules involved, right? You know? seek to understanding the rules of nature that give rise to complexity, like he did in the cricket game. You know, while there's a lot of permutations to how a cricket game is gonna play out, which he went through, the underlying rules guide the game. The underlying rules would determine sort of the format in which it's going to play. It doesn't make every single match completely predictable, but without the rule book in itself, the play could never continue. Science is trying to understand the rules of play. Now, if there's points in which we can get all the rules and, and begin to get a lot greater and greater and greater degrees of sophistication, maybe we can determine all the permutations that can happen in play. And it, sometimes, sometimes we can make some pretty good predictions, but that's not what happens all the time. You see, what we're looking for, the underlying rules, because in nature, 
as Brian Cox said, complexity always emerges from an underlying simplicity, no matter what you look at. He held a little scorecard, a little card. He says, here are the rules of the universe. Basically, everything that happens in the universe can be boiled down to this. But when you look at that, that scorecard and look at the overwhelming complexity of what's around us, then you get to understand that because we're limited up here, right in the noodle, man, right in the in the, the brain, that we have a good idea of how to handle manipulate in the underlying roles, but the complexity gets away from it. So science is a relatively a humble pursuit. And that's what he was trying to talk to us about. So we started looking at the most simple things you know, and build on the simple and try to get up to the level of complexity, you know, that, that, that challenges us to the point where, you know, we can try to get some intelligibility out of it, understand what's going on. All right. Well, science has taken us that to that level in some areas. Sometimes um, the things in which we put together, right, the, the simplicities in which we put together have revealed some complexity. And that's what he was trying to talk to you about the film. Where have we arrived at this point in time after hundreds of years of scientific thinking? What are the highlights in which we've discovered? Of course, the end of, of it when he were talking about you know, the multi-universe theory are, are sort of the epitome of where our science has pushed itself to this day. And, and a very proud thing for scientists at that. It's not necessarily, you know, it's not the focus, of course, of our evaluation. We're going to be looking at the underlying rules of a theory that's very important to us. And that's the theory of evolution, otherwise of natural selection. Looking at the five tenets, how does this rule operate? Right? How does this simple thing give rise to all the complexity around us? And to what level of complexity can we jump to and make it somewhat intelligible? Okay. Now, the aims of science, in which Brian Koff was talking about too, is how does it work? That's very important. Not what it can just discover, but how does it work? You identify patterns, regularities in nature, ask questions about it. You posit explanations for cause and effect relationships. Like if you see a pattern, what causes the pattern? What is the cause? When you can posit an explanation right, that has to be tested, right? In other words, if it's past just your visual, like gaze, like if I threw something across the room and you saw it fly, you could surmise that my throwing it is the cause of something, right? That doesn't need to be tested. You saw it. But if something is beyond the mere be near sight, beyond the sensory realm of us, we need to use experimentation, right? To be able to test what we think is the cause and derive information or data that supports our assumptions about what we see. Now, if we have a way of testing something, testing the cause and an idea about what it is, that's called a hypothesis. Think an hypothesis talks about the cause of an effect or a pattern and it's something that has a way to be tested the hypothesis must be testable if you don't have an explanation which is testable then you're really back down to the assumption level. you're just making an assumption right an educated guess or not it's still an assumption the experimentation must be there and that's why you know when he was talking about in the science that the thing science has found he always had the experimental evidence because he knew that he wouldn't have an hypothesis to address you with unless he had that, right? So again, one thing to think about is that, you know, the aims of science are humble and sometimes we don't make all the advances we want to for one thing. One of the things that stops us from answering questions is not our ability to ask questions, but our ability to detect evidence. It's the technology that's always a limiting factor. Now we can always, test everything in the universe. Well, not test, but we can also ask questions about everything in the universe. But as far as developing hypotheses which are testable, getting the instrumentation that are sensitive enough that we can probe into the areas and deliver information that we can interpret to, you know, to either support or refute a hypothesis can be very difficult. In other words, engineering is always the toughest part. So every generation comes into what we call technology gaps, you know, waiting for that new technology, you know, to bring us forward to answer questions. Thus, it's the technology of humans, you know, and our scientists who can ask the questions that always are interfacing. Those are the ones together that are making their headway. And I have to tell you, I give it to the engineers. You know, they're, they're the ones I take my hat out to because they're the ones that are unlocking the gates, undoing the limits for us to ask, answer questions. All right. Okay. So another part about, you know, why we are here 
is, is important to talk about, you know, the origin, our origin story. And, you know, I chose this video not only to explain how science works, because it gives us an origin story that dates right to the beginning. We might as well start back to the beginning of reality. We don't have to spend a lot of time on it, but enough to make it intelligible. So here was what you have here is a, you know, sort of a depiction of the universe. And if you go over to the left side of, of this little schematic here, little picture here, you see that we have the, ori the origin of reality itself, the birth of our universe, okay? Now, According to Brian Cox um, and other physicists, you know, uh, we have very different approximations on how long ago that occurred. Some think it happened about 13.77 million years ago. You know, others are down into the framework of, you know, 13.83 million years ago. Um, but 13.8 is a nice, good figure. You know, you know, we're talking about, you know, that long in time that we don't really need to quabble about a few million years here or there. So 13.8 is a good figure, right? But what happens in the beginning is all this energy that becomes available in the universe, right? The, the matter begins, it's so hot, it's so dense and so much gravity, it's not even producing any light. Light can't even escape it. You know, it's like a black hole, it's just too much gravitational force. But at about 375,000 years, what happens is, is that the light begins to glow and escape and begin to move, the photons are released, right? So we have a picture of that earliest light. Okay. that's come from us across the universe. And it literally has taken, you know, 13.8 billion years to reach us. Therefore, it's a reflection of all the early light. And that is the picture that Brian Cox showed you at the end. And here it is right there, right? We call that the cosmic microwave background image, the CMB. Okay. So there you go, the picture of the earliest light when the, the universe was 375,000 years old. Well, he said, when you look at it, it's a, it's a remarkably uniform picture. It means the temperature is remarkably uniform, and it is. So if you look at all the dark blue and the light yellows and the reds, you would think those would be big degrees in temperatures, like hot spots. They are. They're, they're differences of millions, of 10 millions of degrees, right? You know, and the way they take these photographs, these images, you know, those aren't hot spots. That's really a uniquely cool image, across, well, a uniquely distributed image. The heat was exactly the same, which meant this. When the initial energy, right, whatever this energy was, right, this fluctuating energy dropped below a certain point, okay, and boom, it released itself into the visible energy, which we see now, it didn't happen from a bang. It happened from an area of space that converted completely at one time, right, all at one time. So the universe was established not in a bang, but was established everywhere at once at the same temperature. And after this period, it began to inflate. Then we have inflationary energy, which is really time. As time begins at that point, as matter arrives, time begins, motion begins, and so the universe begins to expand. All right, great. Well, what happens next? Well, that trough of energy, which he was discovering, which he was talking about, never stops. It's always oscillating, dropping below certain weight, weight energy points, always creating new energy. Uh, two new universes, right? It's locating those universes that have been a long sort of struggle. Now we sort of know by just following the basic rules of physics. And I'm not going to do too much of this, but this way. He said in the film that the one thing is not allowed is empty space, right? A nothingness, nothing. Something has to happen in physics. And that something has to happen in space and time. That means the future has to have things happening in it now. And the past has to have things happening in it now. Everything has to be filled with activity. Well, the thing about it is you're in a universe traveling in one speed of time, one spot of time. That's when we were created. So you're moving towards a future where something's already in and moving forward for that you're occupying the space right behind it, right? Not a physical space, but a space and time, a slot in time. What's ahead of you is another universe. And what's behind you, as soon as we became a visible universe, another wave child came behind and created another universe. They're just right behind us, right? We, we were all interdigitized in time, moving, right? And so all of our universes are ahead of us or behind us in an infinite number. Now, what these universes are like, we don't know. We don't know if there's infinite copies of you and me. Of course, it's interesting you know, to think about that. But right now, that's not a testable hypothesis. You've just gotten to the point where we think that multi-universe holds true. And what we do think is what Brian Cox was saying is that if these universes are all different and the constants of nature can be different in each one of the universes, that some universe out there has got to get the constants of nature just right to allow life to have the rest in the forms that we see it in our universe. You know, thus because there are an infinite number of universes, there has to be one with life and we won that ticket. 
Of course, there could be other universes with life, right? And it could be very similar to us or exactly the same, but we don't know that yet. Okay. That's a really interesting consideration. Right? Let's back down away from the interesting, you know, cosmological aspects of it and ground it into something about, you know, how we arrived here, you know, and really our forms of life. Where did it come from? And, and now that we've sort of got like a brief sort of background on it, but sort of how it happened and when it happened. Okay. One of the interesting things about it is that like you guys are looking at this chart, like, oh my God, that's chemistry. I hate chemistry. Well, so do I. I was a chemistry major at the University of California. I got my first degree in chemistry. I hated every second of it, right? For you guys who love chemistry, oh, bless you, because I hate the damn thing more than life itself, right? But, you know, in life, when I start looking at this stuff, I find it very interesting because I look at a table like this, and it's not really a table. All it is is showing 103 different things, showing me the entire universe. That's it. That's all of the universe right there. Now, really, only about 95 of those, up to about American, um, Amer 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 is about the, 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 the only element that will really occur in most places. The rest of them, like Syria and Berkeley and California and Einsteinium, these things only exist brief moments at a time under really rare conditions. They don't exist in the universe in most places, right? Only rare times, right? But 95 things make up everything around you, including you. I mean, this is you too. I mean, just in different arrangements. So, you know, as far as the organic world, you are linked to it because you have the same sorts of, of chemical compounds, right? The same building blocks. So all the complexity arises from this underlying simplicity. That's a perfect example. You know, basically 95 things create the infinite of around us, every structure, everything, every creature on earth, which is different. And by understanding the underlying rules of this is what chemistry is after, try to get a glimpse of how the complexity is actually produced. So how does this you know, pertain to us in an anthropology class past the simplicity to the complexity route, right? But other things, one thing Brian, uh, um, not so much Brian was talking about, but he, he mentioned that, you know, how the laws of nature, gravity and the speed of light allow things like carbon and oxygen, which are central to what it is to building a person and life. Well, we get into Robert Hazen's book, you know, he, you know, he starts, uh, you know, talking more about really what's important for like all of the ingredients. But we're not going to talk about how these things really fit together. Let's just think about some of the things that can, that make you. Now, when I pick up a, like a pencil over here, I can look at, oh, it's a good pencil. Or not. You know, I look at a lot of times it's got graphite in it, right? Like on the tip of here, right? And it's a high carbon, that's almost pure carbon, right? Well, that's number six. Well, carbon, there's a whole lot of carbon in me, just like in this organic piece, a lot of that stuff makes me up too, right? So, O to number six carbon. Oxygen, a lot of oxygen in me. And it definitely helps me breathe in because of oxygen, I would die. So number three, yay. Um, what about water? You know, we have to have some oxygen combined with some hydrogen, number one. So number one and number eight come together at 70% of me. Got to have some iron. Got to carry that, that oxygen around my blood. So there's number 26, iron. There's some potassium. Got to have potassium, right? Electrolytes. Other salts, too. Need to have sodium chloride. Nice. We have lots of sodium chloride. There's, there's sodium, number 11. There's chloride, number 17. And there's some potassium down there, number 84. So when I've used something like that, I'm looking at a lot of the things in the universe that are part of me. I am part of this universe, right? And that simplicity has ended up into an overwhelming complexity. I don't know if I consider myself a real complex person, but at least I am on the biological level, you know, is each one of you are too. So that's just another way of conceptualizing, you know, what it is to be human. We have to think about all the ways, tan tangible ways, and think about what it is to be a person. And certainly chemically, and certainly a part of the organic world, it is one of those. All right, so enough of the chemistry stuff. Okay. Now, one thing we can think about too is that um, uh, that how does how are we here? You know, we talk about how are we here too. Um, it's, it's also you know about natural selection, which we'll talk about later. But it's also about how those things came into being. And I'll just give a quick little summary of the stuff. No big deal here. But when the universe started, remember when it goes out of that singularity, you know, and we see some, a background image like this, you know, just about this time. You know, the universe is cooling enough to matter begins, you know, to really come into atoms. You know, the building blocks start showing up. But really, all the building blocks are at that time are number one and number two. All you got is like helium and hydrogen out there and these big old huge gaseous clouds. Nowhere near us. Nowhere near the Earth, right? I mean, that's all there is to it. 
you got to figure out just briefly, you know, how just those two elements get up to 103. What the heck happened? You know, where and how and how? Well, it's really quite an easy process. Why so I love the universe. It's simple to understand. It has to do with stars. All right. So, you know, there's our little Earth over here in this picture right here, right? Our little Earth here. Okay. And there is another planet called Kepler 10c. It's one of the largest rocky planets. It's like us extrasolar planets in a different, you know, solar system way out there in a star system. But even as big as Kepler is, okay, our sun is over a thousand times larger than that. Our one sun, the largest stars in our galaxy, you know, or in their universe are 10,000 times larger than our sun. Our little sun's a little tiny little thing. I keep waking up and, you know, looking at it and like all the little dark dolphins that poke their head out of the water, all the nematodes and frogs and, and you guys that look up there since you're born, you know, see, you know, this thing in the sky, you know, the thing that provides warmth and that's what it is or a tan, that's really what we think about. But really, what does it do and what is its importance and, and what's the difference between the little ones and the big ones? What do they provide for us? I think we need to understand that real quickly. Okay. All right. So here. Our little sun, this is wonderful. You know, hydrogen and helium all crushed up together under gravitational weight. It gets so dang hot in the center that nuclear fusion happens, right? The, the nuclear fusion, the things come together, they release all sorts of, you know, nuclear energy. We don't have to go into that, but tons of pressure, a lot of heat. So these elements, hydrogen and helium, come together and they start sticking together. The building blocks start sticking together. There's so much pressure and heat. And you can make everything up to iron, number 26 in our little sun. I know it, right in the core of our sun, we'll make everything up to iron. Here's the deal. It won't make anything bigger. That's it. It stops at iron completely. But yet there are all these other elements on Earth and in ourselves too, you know? So where did those things come from? Where do we pick those things up? There's potassium number 84. I need to have the potassium. Where is it? How did it come to us? In the bigger stars. Huge, huge stars, right? With so much pressure in the middle. And sometimes these big stars do wonderful things. They explode. They do things called supernovas, right? So there is a, actually a flash of a supernova going off right there. See how dim the other stars are and see that thing, well, wham, it just exploded. There was so much temperature and pressure in that huge star, right? It's probably a, a blue giant, right? A blue super giant. It exploded that it crushed all those elements down together, combined them and made big, heavy elements. And then boom, blew them out to a giant gas cloud that looked exactly like that. Well, similar to that, and many of them look like that. And they're called nebulas. There's a nebula. There's a supernova remnant right there. It's got gold in there. It's got silver. It's got iodine, plutonium, neptonium. It's got all these things that are in our world right now, these big heavier elements. So what happens after a long period of time is that every particle attracts another part. It's the theory of gravity, right? Everything attracts each other and begins to come together, right? So the glass cloud's going to start coming back together, developing a lot of speed and space, you know? rushing together right we'll see what happens here okay so we can see a little image here so the gas clouds begin to come together and they start to swirl it's kind of like water in your sink if you notice you feel your sink with the water you pull the drain out it starts to swirl right that's conservation of, mo of, of motion right we can it's a physics if you take physics you understand the conservation of energy you know and how that actually works but when you see it what happens it begins to spin and spin and spin and it creates a disc it does every time. Every gas cloud out there in space starts to spin. It comes together, creates a disk. And then where the matter is a little clumped together out in the disk, those little things come together, little balls called planets, right? They form under their gravitational weight. More and more stuff gets together. They compact down. And finally, you end up with a solar system, you know, with a nice little sun in the middle. And it gets enough pressure. It ignites, becomes its own little fireball, heats everything up. Planets really close to it, you know, they have more mass and density on the inside. They begin to become the rocky planets with a plethora of all the minerals. And that's why we have all these wonderful different elements on our Earth. We sit at just the right spot, just the right place. It could be just the right temperature, as Brian Cox says. And we have all those building blocks in us, right? And how lucky we are. Um, because what was here before us was a giant star that went supernova that allowed us this new solar system to take place. So in a way, and you know, when you think about the Big Bang, we also have to think about the things that have happened along the way. Man. 
a giant star, who's our parent star, exploded. And then our solar system is nothing but the condensation of that giant gas cloud. Here we go again. And, you know, 4.54 billion years ago, that star exploded and began to condense down. And that was the birth of our solar system. And then we're going to figure out, well, when life started or where life started. Okay. All right. So, you know, one thing we know is it chemical reactions in the atmosphere. Oh, you know, you can't just, what we've known by our laboratory experimentations, that life just can't start the atmosphere. The conditions are not correct. I mean, the atmosphere is responsible for producing some of the wrong ingredients, ingredients which we will look at, and which was talked about by Rocky Star in the video, right? But no, it's not sufficient. So the chemical reactions in the atmosphere are not enough to put complex life together. We can rule that out, okay? okay. Now, people have also thought, well, could life have been brought by, you know, um, you know, through asteroids and meteorites? No, they carry organic material, though. they do. They actually do, they carry organic material. We got pretty heavily bombarded by a lot of asteroids and a lot of you know big meteorites, a lot of rocks early in the development of Earth. And those brought a ton of raw material for life, lending to the complexity. That's what I mean by that. Now, Robert Hayden says the Earth began earlier, what right? different form, with about 200 different minerals, 250, that's it, that's it. Well, now we've got 5,000 on Earth, you know, 4.54 billion years, we've gone to 250 to 5,000. But we've got to figure out, you know, the steps, what's happened, because it's important. And I'll tell you what, you can get complex life, more complex life when you have more minerals, right? And that's it. The more minerals Earth gets, the more complex the ingredients that we put together for the raw materials for life. And we can get complex life like you and me, right? Okay. And all the other complex forms too. So we need to try to understand a little bit about how that complexity increases. Well, one is that there's some bombardment that starts happening by meteorites. They start bringing in all sorts of other wonderful compounds and organic material, which we can use for raw ingredients. So later on, when we put together life, we'll see all that stuff. Now, the next, chemical reactions in near uh, deep sea vents or within sea vents. Yes, yes. We, we actually think that Sometimes many of the, the hydrothermal vents that we have on Earth are, are liable place, are good places uh, for uh, the efflorescence of life. And in fact, there are leading hypotheses now. We'll, we'll step into exactly why. And this is also one thing that was outlined by Robert Hazen in both Lice Rocky Start and in his book, right? The Story of Earth. So we'll be looking and concentrating on deep sea vents. Before we get there, we need to get the precursors all together before we can assemble them in those deep sea, deep sea vents. All right. So one of the earliest experiments to see, you know, how raw materials are coming together on Earth uh, was the Miller-Urey experiment that happened back in the 1950s, a long time ago. Even I wasn't bored then. So, um, you know, Stanley Miller and Robert Urey got together and, and uh, they were doing an experiment and they said, well, um, we know what the early atmosphere of Earth was like. We've got some older rocks. We can see some of the, the components that were in there. And it looked like there was just like, there was some water on Earth, you know? Uh, you know, early on there was, and we'll talk about wind in a second, but you know, water on Earth, we had a lot of methane in the atmosphere, like calforts, right? You CH4 as calforts. Uh, some ammonia, you guys just smell ammonia, like cleaning ammonia, that's what it was, you know, that would be the atmosphere. And some hydrogen gas, some hydrogen gas, like it was the Hindenburg, the one that blew up, right? So that was it. That was the Earth atmosphere. There's no oxygen up there, nothing. So, you know, following the normal cycles of just water evaporating, going up into the clouds and up into the atmosphere, you know, what would it have been like? What would the chemical conditions would have been like? So what they did was they, they put this glass apparatus together, boiled up that seawater like it was going to condense into clouds into a little chamber where this, for the, for the you know, the cow fart stuff in there, the, you know, the, uh, sorry, the methane was there and the ammonia and the hydrogen gas. And then they did something that typically happens in the Earth's atmosphere early on and now lightning. So they ran electrical charge through it. Really, what began to happen, the first things, is they started to produce um, hydrocarbons, you know, long carbon chains that create organic molecules, the stuff, the stuff that we're made of, stars are made of, the start of, you know, the complex organic molecules started to come out, right? Um, so, you know, 10 to 15% of the carbon, you know, ended up sort of going into these long chain sort of fatty things, right? These fatty sort of molecules started producing. And then, you know, they started running it longer and longer and longer. And lo and behold, what began to happen is amino acids um, were, were being formed, you know? 
small the building blocks of proteins. And it was making like all 20 of them that life sort of needs right up in the atmosphere. So really what they figured out is the earth had all the initial conditions that were necessary to build most of the building blocks of life, not put them together, but provide all the raw material. Then on top of normal earth processes and all the stuff meteorites are right bringing on, we had a really good cocktail for all the stuff life needed. Now we just needed a place, a place that they could be assembled, right? And under the right conditions. Let's have a look at where those places were at. Okay. Not on land, I'll tell you that. And uh, one of the reasons is, is well, solar radiation. At that time, there's no ozone. So the UV it would be like you outside, your, your skin is going to burn off or get up skin cancer in like three days or whatever. It would just be horrible. Uh, you know, so the UV light would completely, you know, sterilize the surfaces, even, you know, in water three to four feet deep. So with this idea of maybe in shallow ponds somewhere, no, not in shallow ponds, it's not in shallow ponds. Certainly, you might have the organic material, everything is some, you know, they're ready, but no, no, life would never have a chance. We need to get down somewhere, somewhere where life already exists, as an example, right? Protected from the early atmosphere, a place that's warm, right? a place with lots of energy, right? Um, and a place we still find life at, and hydrothermal vents. And we find these little organisms that we call extremophiles, but the ones that live in these things are called thermophiles. They live in, in temperatures of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of degrees, they still do today. And when we look at these microorganisms, we realize that they're very primitive and look probably a lot like, you know, the first life that was on earth. The first life on earth was incredibly almost indestructible because these thermophiles that we find today um, are almost too, it's incredible what they can actually survive. And what else about these things, these thermophiles that live in these vents is they don't require food sources. They all they do is they utilize the energy that comes from the hydrothermal vents, the electrical energy, we'll talk about that. And the chemicals, right? The chemicals that come through the, the vents and they utilize those as a food source, right? So they're using chemical energy, those that exist today. And these would be reminiscent of our first ancestors, the first common ancestors, we're doing the same thing. All right. So um, we've talked about, I'm gonna talk to you a little more about the assembling of, of, of life, but another place in which is producing raw material, and this is very important, and exactly what Robert Hazen was talking about in his book, um, we're in muds and clays. And we take mud and clay and we look at it like it was squishy and stuff, and the ash from it's nasty, you know, I used to throw my little brother or whatever. But, you know, we make houses with it. But I'll tell you what, if you really look at the chemical structure of clay, there are very, very complex chemical uh, arrangements in there. You know, sheets of micas and fibers, right? And what's very complex chemical reactions happen, including the synthesis of RNAs. They spontaneously, I mean, these are the destruction codes, right? Spontaneously assemble within these things. And they randomly do this. So they're randomly making billions and billions and billions of different sorts of RNA codes. And if these were actually to get into our, our primitive ancestors, they would start by utilizing to code the production of proteins. They could be assembled that way just by the random number, the sheer volumes of, of the amounts of muds and clays that existed on Earth. So these are really exciting places in which we look to in muds, right? I, I don't do that for a living, of course, you know, but I love, I find it very interesting what people are doing with that. So we can kind of understand how life originated on earth. Okay, well, here we are. This is the place our manufacturing, this is home, this is mom, right? You know, this is an undersea hydrothermal vent. Now here on earth today, you know, we, we only have like a few hundred square miles where these things still exist. Um, but in the early earth, Wow, well, we had a lot more geothermal en energy that there were literally millions of square miles of vents like this across all the oceans across the surface of the Earth. Millions of square miles of this stuff. So we're talking about what are the likelihood of, of assemblies of something, the first forms of life. They can actually be quite high when you're talking about millions of square miles of this. And what these things are doing is you know, there's geothermal energy from you know hot lava below and the water enters you know, the rock, turns into steam and gets blasted out. Well, as that steam blasts out, you know, it's picking up raw material from the rocks. And it's also sucking in water, which is rich with ammonia and amino acids and all the stuff that's created in the atmosphere. All the stuff that's created by clay, like the RNAs, all the fats, everything you need to assemble is being pushed together and moved through the channels, the pores of these rocks, right? 
And what's really exciting is that some of those, you know, the long chain fatty acids, we talked about the long carbon things that they're being produced. That's the stuff that your cell membranes are made out of, fats. And there's something else that we found too, and I'll tell you, it's really sort of interesting. And they also call these things black smoke. There's like three names, they're hydrothermal vents. A lot of people call them alkali vents. And we'll talk about that for a reason. And just black smokers, right? So I don't, I don't know why, I don't know. I just call them hydrothermal vents, okay. All right, so here's a, that little schematic about, you know, the thermal vents in the middle, there's the magma now heating it all up. And then all that stuff, you know, all these amino acids and raw materials, you know, that are flowing into that stuff that get pushed together, you know, in all sorts of interesting ways and all sorts of billions and billions of different combinations, not just in one vent, but across the millions of you know, square miles of these vents, right? So that creates the statistical likelihood of something interesting happening. Well, you know, what we can think about too is that those fats I was talking about that are being made, you know, those long chain hydrocarbons that are being made in the atmosphere, what happens is if you put them together, they spontaneously make little droplets of liquid. They make little cellular membranes because all they are is taking like fat and sticking a little like phosphorus on it. You know, and you put these things together, they create a membrane structure like that, just like your own cells. And they spontaneously form. They do. You know, they form little droplets when you mix them with water. And what's more interesting about them is that when these droplets gets big enough, they automatically divide, even though there's nothing in them except the fat themselves. One gets big enough, it divides. One gets big enough, divides. And they're creating little cellular structures, all ready for them to be, you know, statistically likely of the right mixture getting in together to start this life, right? This is a continuous process happening trillions and trillions and trillions of times per second in these hydrothermal vents, you know, over millions of square miles of ocean surfaces. But what are we missing? We're missing something. I keep thinking I'm hungry right now. I keep thinking about how animals and every all life needs energy. We have to have an energy source, you know, and the type of energy source all life has. We don't think about it all the time, but you know, I eat food. But ultimately, what happens to it? We break it down, and what's that? The food is turned into electrochemical energy, and finally into electrical energy. You're like, you're like a giant light bulb. You put out so much wattage as you do, we can measure your electricity. You put like 150 watts of electricity out of your body. All of us do, except Cardi B, she's like 300. I love Cardi B, she's so full of energy. I love that girl. Anyway, so you know, all this wattage of electricity. So basically we need electric current to get us going. That's really what powers our data, causes all the chemical reactions in our body. So how do these things get electrical currents? Well, I'll tell you what. If we go back and we look at those hydrothermal vents, I'll tell you how. See, I told you that they were also called alkaline vents. Okay, so that just means like, okay, their pH is like high, they're alkaline. They're not, they're, they're not like the seawater outside of them is pot is pot is pH is lower. So it's acidic. So we have alkaline inside of the vents, you know, inside the rocks, and we have acidic water on the outside of the vents. What this really does, it sets up a charge separate. You know, like two, two lines, you get positive and negative. And we get a current that flows across through the seawater, through the water, into the vent and all the pores and across those little cells themselves, little, you know, those early, you know, bubbles of fat, you know, little droplets are like our membranes. And we have a constant, consistent electrical supply. That is the energy, the spark of life that begins right there in those vents. And today, the extremophiles that live there are living off that energy source. They're still maintaining that energy source, that electrochemical gradient, that geochemical gradient. And they're still getting the nutrients, right? The, the chemical nutrients from the, the vent sacs themselves, right? So they ha still have that primitive life way that our first common ancestor uh, began with. We hypothesized began with, okay? All right. Okay, so, you know, extremophiles everywhere on earth right now they live you even believe how indelible life is i love them they live in the arctic you know they live in places where you won't believe like even anthrax can live in the vacuum of space it's even hard to kill it with poison you can boil it you can throw it in a fire and it just seems to live you know these extremophiles that we have on earth were hardy 
you know, and it shows us that life can really be tough and it can exist in places like, you know, these hydrothermal vents. Now, the trick though, for our ancestors was not living and developing a living organism down there, but freeing yourself from that. Where's your energy source? How are we going to expand away from it? You know, there is Mother, your Earth, you know, providing you all the electric current you need, you know, all this chemical energy and all these nutrients. What's next? Well, the next is a big mystery, but it did happen. That life evolved and changed to be able to get a different energy source. And the next energy source was the sun. It was photosynthesis, right? The capture of the photons, the light. Okay. And what life did was, is that life took in carbon dioxide from the atmosphere with lots of it. And with the help of that sunlight, the energy from it, started to break down the CO2 bonds and create bigger structure, right? And these things are called glucose sugars, okay? So the plants are creating sugars. And then they would take those sugars, then later rupture the bonds, and those bonds would create electrical energy, which the plant would use to build more complex structure, right? That's what when you do, you break your food down, you're creating electrical energy. So do plants. Well, the magic of this is that every time, you know, those bonds are broken by the plant, what the plant eliminates, what it breathes out is oxygen. It breathes in CO2 and breathes out oxygen. You're the reverse. You know, you breathe, you breathe in oxygen and breathe out CO2, and then the plants breathe in that, breathe in that CO2 and they breathe oxygen. But for the first time, the atmosphere on the earth was getting oxygen and from these plants, and it had a tremendous effect. Oxygen is nasty. It totally is. And we don't, we're sort of immune to it and inert to it, right? We're conditioned for it. All the chemicals can handle it, right? But I'll tell you what, oxygen just destroys stuff. You put enough oxygen on something, it will rip the paint off stuff. It just does nasty things. It's called oxidation. And it changes chemical compounds, puts new chemical compounds together. And that's when the complexity of minerals on life really starts taking off. All this new oxygen in the environment gets caught in the rock cycle. Oxygen adds to all these rocks and a completely different level of complexity happens. Well, how do we know? Isn't that an interesting thing? Well, how do we know? Well, here's the thing. That when you liberate free oxygen to the atmosphere, um, and, and this is, you know, probably happened, you know, within... Oh, you know, two, three hundred million years after Earth was formed, Earth looked a lot like this at that time. But it happened first. The Earth, of course, was just a black ball, homogeneous, all the same minerals, super hot, you know, thin shell. You were on the surface like 500 degrees or a thousand degrees. You're running around up and dying a couple seconds of meltdown. Ah, it'd be horrible, right? Well, 50 million years later, our young Earth gets hit by a planetoid that grazed us called Thea knocks off a piece of our crust, it becomes the moon, right? And that's how, that's what the moon would have looked like. It would have been really close to us and orbiting at a pretty high velocity. Well, since then it's moved away from earth and it's slowing down. And we know that because it's still slowing down. It will slow down a little bit even within your own lifetime measurably. And it slows down and moves further and further away from us, right? But back then, boy, it was humming and the tides were huge, rushing everywhere, throwing water, mixing it with lava pouring over everywhere, creating all sorts of new compounds and new minerals. And as the earth began to cool, things happened. Like when you mix oil with water, you watch it separate. The heavier elements began to sink to the bottom. The lighter elements began to come to the top, right? It was just an old part of separation over time. And the stuff at the top was lighter, like the granite you see in the Sierras. And this became part of the continents we have now. And the earth became gray. It went from sort of a black color to a gray color. Right? And as the chemicals began to, the rocks began to separate, the minerals began to separate, chemical reactions facilitated the, the deposit of water. That's one of the side effects of well, the other you know, chemical reagents is water that comes out of products, right? At plus with some comets that were hailing down us, they're delivering us water too. The oceans began to fill and we became bluer. All of a sudden the earth turned blue and now we're set the stage for those hydrothermal vents at the bottom and protected areas away from all that UV radiation, you know, able to pull in all those nutrients down there to facilitate the origin of first life. And then it frees itself from the hydrothermal vents and begins to utilize, you know, photosynthesis and then things change. How do they change? Well, first thing we know 
is that the ocean water is full of a lot of free iron and stuff like that. Boy, when you put raw iron or metals in the face of oxygen, all hell breaks loose because it chemically reacts and turns these things into oxides. They glump together, they precipitate, and they fall straight down. There you go. Look at that. Rusted iron. That stuff is 3.5 billion years old. We dated it like miles and miles and miles thick because that great oxygenation event caused all of this rusting and all of this iron fell to the bottom. We got to find a culprit. Who did it? Oh, they're on the left, right? Just like he stated in Life's Rocky Start, there's the first creatures, organisms that are actually utilizing, you know, light from the sun. This is so exciting here, right? These are living colonies of, of photosynthesizing bacteria. And they're producing structures we call stromatolites, stromatolites, right? And really what those are is that you imagine that the first one started out the very bottom. And as they died, their, their, you know, their relatives built on top of them and they lived their life and died. And then their relatives built on top of them, built their lives and died. You know, of course, you keep building these little things in the bottom, absorb all sorts of calcium. They become like a hard as a rock. So you have a structure they keep building on. So you're looking at hundreds and thousands of years of just building upon their ancestors all the way to the top. And really, it's only the surface top that is living, right? But you had entire oceans filled with stromatolites like this, you know, taking in the light from the sun and releasing all this oxygen. Now we have re we have reliably dated those to 3.5 and some back to 3.2 billion years. That's the exact time those banded iron formations, those rusted formations, were formed too. Right. So we know what was happening when the first photosynthetic bacteria were out there, and when the banded iron happened, and when the Earth literally turned red for a while. Right. All right. So today I don't want to go any further than that. We're just going to give some brief explanation to you know where we think life started, what it was like. Um, you know, and how it began to free itself. Now we've got quite a little journey to go to because we've got to get from these photosynthetic bacteria to the complex animals, right? That's, that's where we sort of begin. I and mean, which complex animals lend rise to us? And what was our trajectory up to, to the point now? So that's what we're going to be starting to track next week, getting towards complex life. All right. So that's as much as I wanted to discuss today. I hope you guys maybe have uh, you know, uh, enjoyed this or learned something from it. And of course, if you have any questions or concern, you know, let me know. Okay, bye.